So I don't want to be too harsh on you here, um, but I think you need to realize how it sounds. I'm imagining your sister listening to this, right? You need to realize how it sounds when you say things like, her actual life is totally fine. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 283. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a question and answer podcast, as has been the usual. So two really good questions today from listeners like yourself. If you want to send in a question, uh, give me an email. DuffThePsych at gmail.com is where you can reach me. Um, I've had a lot of really good questions recently. Oh my God, my chair is so squeaky. I need to fix that. Pro podcaster right here. <laughs> anyway, I've had a lot of really good questions lately, so thank you for those. Um, a couple, or these two that I have on this episode are, are ones that were, I think, basically just sent in. Um, and we cover two very different topics, um, one related to depression, one related to uh, addiction, actually. Um, please don't be afraid to send in questions, even if you think that uh, maybe the topic isn't perfectly relevant to the podcast, or it's maybe a little too niche or something like that, too specific, uh, just send them in. Let me make that choice. And and it's good to have a variety of questions. You know, um, I I feel like we're able to cover a wide uh, variety of different topics on the show, which is one of the things that I think makes it cool. And, uh, you know, the show's been around for quite a while now. It's been years. So I, I need a good variety of things to choose from. So don't be afraid to send in your question, even if you don't think I'm going to take it or anything like that. Uh, let's see. Is there anything to update you on? Not really. Um, aside from the fact that I, I mentioned last time, you know, I have um, some some books that would be great gifts to anybody in your life that is, you know, focused on improving their mental health or just personal exploration. In particular, the uh, 500 Journal Prompts book, um, the one that I put out recently. It's on Amazon platforms. It's it's published by Amazon. So if you have Prime, you can still get it. Um, you know, before the Christmas holiday, if that's what you celebrate. Um, but it's a it's a perfect size stocking stuffer. You know, it's like I said about palm sized. I think I mentioned that before. So um, really thin book, and it's just great. Just a collection of five hundred journal prompts. You know, random stuff, um, things that are deep in nature, things that are maybe a little silly in nature, things that are there for artistic or personal exploration, a lot of good stuff. And I I continue to use these constantly myself for my own exploration, asking people questions. It's a really good way to get to know other people as well. If you're dating or you are just trying to get to know a a new connection or friend or something like that, pulling from the questions in the journal prompts book is a a great way to really uh, kind of cut through the bullshit and get some really interesting information about them. So consider that if, if you are looking for more stocking stuffers or something for yourself, you know, you need some uh, uh, prompts to help you with your own personal exploration. Maybe you have some downtime for the holiday and you want to do some journaling or just thinking. That's a good way to do it. That's enough of my own personal advertisement there. Thank you for bearing with that. Got to pay the bill somehow, you know. Uh, but yeah, why don't we go ahead and just jump into the episode? Two really good questions here. And let's just get to the first one. Okay, first question reads, Hi, this is a question for the podcast. My sister has been depressed on and off for over 20 years and has taken medication for much of it. Recently, she has been diagnosed with ADHD and now takes medication for this, although it has made no difference. I'm writing because she is in a place of sheer overwhelm and extremely low, although her actual life is totally fine, although tiring as she has a one and three-year-old. She sees everything with an intensely negative lens and is extremely self-absorbed in the most negative possible way. I have always been someone she talks to and will continue to be, but I just don't know what to do or what she should do. She gets trapped in a negative spiral, which links to terribly low self-esteem. 
She's especially bad at the moment and may be heading towards a breakdown. I'm so worried about her, but also frustrated as nothing bad is happening in her life, and I'm so not sure how to help. If you're able to talk about this problem on your podcast, I would be grateful. Thank you so much for reading this and for your podcast in general. Uh, you're very welcome for the podcast. It's my pleasure. And thank you for the question. Um, I hear a lot of care in this question. You know, obviously you're writing this in because you have concerns about your sister who you do care about and you've been a, a support to. I need to say, I also hear a lot of judgment. Um, her experience is clearly different from your own internal experience that you have. And I think what's happening is it's really hard for you to put yourself in her shoes and imagine how she could possibly feel this way. And I understand where your frustration comes from. Um, it, totally. It, it can be absolutely hard standing on the sidelines of somebody's depression, especially if that person is a family member. That makes it even more complicated and more personal, honestly, because you do have that insider scoop and, you know, family is a little bit more complicated than friends or, you know, acquaintances, professional connections, anything like that. So it can absolutely be hard. And trust me, as a therapist, you know, myself, it can be very difficult at times to be on the outside looking at someone's situation from a more sort of a detached, maybe objective perspective, though none of us are purely objective, but from an outside perspective and seeing the things that are right there, the things that could be helping them, right? That can be very difficult. What seems like an obvious answer or low-hanging fruit that's like, it's just, just, just crap right there, that one little thing that'll make such a big difference. It might seem impossible for them to grasp when, from my perspective, it's like, just make this tweak. It's right there for you, you know? And so I can understand that to an extent, for sure. But that's how mental health issues work. That's, that's how they work. You know, they wouldn't be a problem if they were easy to solve. And as you mentioned, she's been dealing with depression on and off for over 20 years. <laughs> you know, I don't think that she would choose to do that. Um, so it can be very, very difficult to, to understand how that can be, but this is how mental health issues work. There are definitely certain like cleaner issues, things like grief. And when I say cleaner, I don't mean that it's easy because it's not, but things like grief or maybe like reactional depression, uh, due to a big life change or something like that change in circumstances. Those are simple enough to understand. And they, they tend to have sort of a start and some form of an end where things aren't quite as devastating and there's a kind of clear arc to the treatment of it. But things like chronic depression don't necessarily work the same way. They can be treated, you know, the, the research indicates they can be treated effectively, um, but they are difficult to treat. I, I, even depression, you know, one of the most common mental health difficulties, you know, if somebody has major depressive disorder, you might assume that it's like, well, okay, it's super common, so therefore it's easy to treat, right, given the right approaches. Fuck no, <laughs> it's not. It, it, all of these things are difficult to treat. Um, it, you know, they're important to, to get help for, but very difficult because they are often inherently illogical, right? They don't make sense. And that's also frustrating for the person living with it. They have the knowledge that they should, air quotes, should feel better. And that just makes them feel even more guilty and feeds into the depression further, right? So they feel bad. They look around them and they say, you shouldn't feel bad. You should feel grateful for all the stuff you have. You could have it a lot worse. And then they say, yeah, you should, you idiot. You're terrible. Why are you feeling so bad when you have it so good? Gosh, you're an idiot. And then they get deeper into the depression and then it spirals further, right? So depression and anxiety and many mental health issues are very, very self-sustaining in that way. And they bypass logic a lot of times. And it's very hard work to bring it back into the logical realm if that's the type of, you know, approach that you're using, say, in therapy or whatever approach you're using. It, it can be tough to make a difference there. So I don't want to be too harsh on you here, um, but I think you need to realize how it sounds. I'm imagining your sister listening to this, right? You need to realize how it sounds when you say things like her actual life is totally fine, right? So for somebody who's been depressed, depressed on and off for 20 years, to hear your life is totally fine, that might sting a bit. And that's not for you to decide. That's your external evaluation of it from what you see. Um, but there may be um, a lot of factors that are good, that are smooth, taken care of, um, things to be grateful for, things that are perhaps easy in her life. But depression is a subjective experience. It's an internal individual experience. And especially chronic major depression, that's not a reaction to circumstances. That's not just, oh, work was bad this week, so I'm depressed now. That can be a piece of it, you know, and people can certainly be thrown into a depressive episode 
by a lot of misfortune that they go through, but that's not the sole way that it works. It's uh, more complicated than that and it's more enduring than that. Often for people like your sister, it's a persistent life experience. And as I said, it's very self-sustaining. It keeps itself going and depression kind of really wants to keep itself safe. So whenever you try to affect change in it, it sort of fights back and that takes it out of you and again, feeds into that depression monster. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Man, so as a professional therapist, I can tell you that if you are seeing an elevation in your symptoms or just a decrease in your general wellness, you are not alone right now. This period of time in the year can be brutal for some people. It can also be very lonely and isolating. So there's a good chance that you would benefit from some extra support. So why not check out BetterHelp? If there's something that you need some help with, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You'll be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line or self-help. This is professional therapy done securely online. The service is available to clients across the world, and there's a broad range of expertise available. So you may find people that aren't available in your local area. Just log into your account at any time, and you can send a message to your therapist. That'll get you a timely and thoughtful response back, and you can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to great therapeutic matches, so if you need to switch therapists, it's free and easy to do so. Um, they have financial aid available if you qualify, and in general, it tends to be more affordable than traditional offline therapy. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Go to their website, check out some of the reviews, and when you're ready, visit betterhelp.com slash duff. That's better H-E-L-P dot com slash duff and join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. So a special offer for you guys, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast listeners, you get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash death. All right, back to the show. I also want to say that having a one and a three-year-old is also very taxing for some people. I've had my wife on the show a variety of times, and she's been very honest about her own mental health struggles. You know, she is somebody who does struggle with depression, um, as well as, you know, bipolar too. And uh, we have uh, a three and a five-year-old, almost four and six. Oh my God. Side note, uh, my five-year-old read us read to us before bed tonight, which blew my fucking mind. I can't believe he's doing that now. <sighs> anyway, but we have a, a three and a five-year-old. And so, you know, for um, for us and for my wife, Joelle, you know, you, you should listen to some of the podcasts that we've done together because she kind of explains her experience with it, where she loves her kids and at the same time, with the mental health experience that she has, they can be very challenging for her. And parenting can be very challenging for her. So having a one and a three-year-old, you know, it, it, you said it could be tiring. Definitely. It can also be very taxing for some people in terms of their own mental health and physical health. Um, with a one-year-old, you know, she may still be in a phase of postpartum depression as well. You don't necessarily know what goes on behind the scenes in her everyday parenting life. I'm sure you get glimpses and you have plenty of insider information, but the the real minutia of the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, you know, there are these little micro moments that uh, can be very challenging for certain people, um, you know, given things like depression. So just be aware of that. Um, it could be that parenting is very hard for her. And then that, in turn, you know, as, as a woman probably makes her feel very guilty, and as a mom, it makes her feel very guilty, like, ugh, who am I to have a hard time parenting, especially, again, with all this good stuff around me, and to be fortunate, to be able to provide for my kids, yada, 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 right? So the guilt that comes along with that of having a hard time parenting feeds back into the depression and makes her, makes her feel bad. So just be aware of that. Um, and, and that should be, hopefully, you know, all of the uh, the finger wagging at you that I'm going to do. Again, I'm not upset at you about this, and I don't mean to be harsh, but I do want to kind of drive that point home. And this is not just for you, but it's for anybody who might be in a position like yours where they're standing on the outside of someone's depression, looking at it and shaking their head about, like, why are you so depressed about this? So let's talk about what we can do productively here. I think it's awesome that she trusts you. I think that's amazing. Um, and that you're a person she feels she can always come to with, with issues that she might be having. That speaks a lot to your relationship and also probably what kind of listener you are. You know, if you gave her a hard time every time she came to you with an issue, she would probably stop coming to you with issues. So that speaks to, you know, your ability to be there as well as your relationship together. 
Um, and as a family member and a confidant, you know, those are really your roles here. As a family member and a confidant, you don't need to know how to help her. That's not your job. You know, you're not a, you're not a professional therapist. Your job here is to be there for her to the extent that you can. It is not your responsibility to fix her situation. And you are also allowed to have your own boundaries. Sometimes you may not have the space to be there for her in the same way that you might another time. And that's totally all right. You have your own stuff. You know, depression is um, not a very nice, clean issue where it only affects one person. It does affect systems and people around them. And so for you, you might wax and wane in your ability to, to be able to kind of hold that space for her and, you know, be unconditional in your love for her and just sort of listen. Uh, your frustration builds, your, your fatigue with the issues builds and stuff like that. And, and that's all right. It's all right. You're allowed to have those feelings. Um, you mentioned that she's on medication for depression. Uh, you didn't mention whether she receives any type of therapy, whether that's individual or group or what. If you feel like maybe she does need that, you know, that would help that she could use somebody professional to talk to and somebody who is, this is important, uh, less afraid to rock the boat, right? Because you as a family member, as I said, it's more complicated because, you know, if you're to really challenge her on certain things, like, hey, you're not doing any of these things that could be helping you, uh, that's inherently personal because it's coming from a family member. And so, you know, that might affect the family relationship. <laughs> you know, if you were to do that, the, you know, right now, as I'm recording this, you know, you have holiday season coming up, maybe that screws up Christmas dinner or something. So it can be um, difficult to know when to rock the boat, when to just let things be, etc. So having a professional who knows this stuff, who is willing to, you know, rock the boat, and that's not like all we do in therapy. We're not just there to poke and prod people and, you know, piss them off. But um, we can't be afraid to bring up difficult issues and maybe even, you know, challenge her about things. That's, that's really where a therapist comes in. They can work to provide accurate empathy, right? So ideally, they start off with hearing her, understanding where she's coming from and communicating that understanding. So she goes, okay this person gets it. You know, I don't have to lie to them. I don't have to pretend to be better than I am. I don't have to explain every single thing. They understand. And so that will help the therapist build a good working relationship with her. And then they use the sort of structure of that relationship to move her forward toward change in, in whatever way they think is going to be the most helpful. Um, so therefore, uh, in talking with her, maybe it would be useful if this fits within the type of communication you have it might be useful to orient her toward getting some treatment. And I think that this can absolutely be communicated from a place of care, not just judgment or, um, you know, being mean in any sort of way. I think it can definitely come from a place of care. Ideally, though, um, and you don't have full control over this, so don't judge yourself too harshly if you, you know, miss the mark or something like that. But ideally, you want to try to avoid making her feel, feel guilty or like a burden for bringing these things to you, right? So, what you don't want to say is like, Ugh, I, I just can't take this anymore. You know, you need to go see somebody. You need to see a therapist because you're driving the rest of us crazy, <laughs> right? That would probably not be a very productive thing to say to her. Um, instead, you can say like, listen, I, I love you so much. And I, I love being somebody that you come to. It, it means a lot to me that you trust me. I know you don't trust a lot of people. I'm worried about you though. Uh, it seems like you've been having a harder and harder time. And to me, it looks like this pattern is just going downward and it, it, I'm worried about how this might end for you, that it might be something that's hard to come back from or that drives you to a breakdown or something that affects your kids. And this is something I can't help you with because I don't know how. I'm not an expert. I'm just your sister. But I want you to have some relief and it doesn't look like that's happening and I don't know if this is going to spontaneously go away. So what do you think about getting some professional help? Like, is there anything that I can do to help push you in that direction or help you find somebody? Um, there's, you know, a lot of things that I might be able to do to help ease that along. But have you thought about getting some professional help right now? You know, opening in a way like that where you're starting with the care, you're expressing your concern, your legitimate worry and concern about her, and then sort of just, you know, reminding her that you can't fix this for her. You want to be there, but this is maybe one of the best ways you can be there for her by pushing her toward this. Um, and you also, you know, throughout all of this, you need to be honest with yourself about how good of a support you can be. Um, you know, you could even tell her that you're just too close to the situation. It is personal. She is your sister, right? You can tell her that you're too close to the situation to really be helpful right now. 
and that sometimes you get caught up in everything too. And you are very um, cognizant of not causing her further harm. You don't want to cause her further harm by being wrapped up in it with her and saying the wrong thing or, you know, telling her advice that just isn't, isn't healthy because that's not your realm. You could talk about that. You can be honest with her about that as well as honest with yourself about that. But your role here is, uh, you know, it's not to approve of her choices. It's just to be a sister. Uh, you can empathize with her pain without fully understanding it and being able to empathize with it or trying to solve it, right? You can be there for her and say, you know, I see you hurting. And that doesn't mean, though, that you have to drop every single thing and let her constantly vent to you at every moment. Um, you don't have to do that. And you don't have to play into her negative spiral either. You don't have to agree with everything she says and say, you know what, you're so right. And uh, that's terrible for you. And I understand why you feel bad and, you know, on and on. You don't have to continue to kind of play into that. But really, you can focus on the fact that you recognize she's struggling. You know, tell her that you care, that you see her pain that she's going through. Remind her that she's loved. Um, if there are some practical things you can do to help, cool. You know, I, I've talked before on the podcast about kind of real practical things like, let me take your kids for a little bit. Let me take them out so you can have a bath and just relax. Or, you know, here's a, here's a gift card to uh, Instacart or, you know, whatever food delivery service. So you can not have to worry about dinner for a night, you know, things like that. Um, those are some practical things that can be done. If you can do that, cool. If not, that's okay too. You don't have to. If you do want to understand her better, because like I said, it's, it's, it's totally understandable for you to not really have the perspective and the understanding of how she can be depressed in this sort of way, because that's not your experience. You know, it's like just trying to understand someone else's internal world. But if you do want to under, understand her better, I would encourage you to embrace some curiosity about it. I think that her subjective feeling on the inside is, is very different from the picture of what you see on the outside. And you could bring that up to her, right? You could always bring that up to her and ask her what it feels like and say something like, I don't want to make you feel guilty about this because I don't think that you're doing anything wrong here, but I just see life so differently. And um, it's hard for me to, to, to know what this is like for you. And I want to, I want to understand more of what life is like for you. I know you're not making it up, but it's just hard for me to imagine what it feels like to be depressed in a situation, you know, like we see here. Can you help me? Can you tell me like what depression is like for you? Um, maybe even talk about how it's different from what you see from me or other people. Um, you know, it seems like it doesn't really matter whether things are good or bad in your life. This thing just keeps coming back. So, so what does it feel like? You know, being curious like that, not trying to avoid the judgments, you know, don't throw too many labels out yourself. Just open with that curiosity and see if she's willing to talk about it a bit. She may not be, and she may even have, you know, depending on how depressed she is, she may have a hard time really verbalizing it and expressing it and trying and being able to make it make sense for you. But that's a better place to be, I think, with that curiosity than the judgment, than saying, look, your life is fine. Why are you so depressed? And I know you're probably not saying those things to her, but in your mind, it, it can be helpful for you to temper the frustration that you're feeling with understanding, right? Um, and again, I'll reiterate that you can redirect her toward professional help. You can recognize her pain, you can express concern, and you can see if she can be nudged toward a therapist or, you know, you said she's been on medication for a lot of this time. I'm not sure if she's getting that from her primary care doctor or if she has a psychiatrist, what the deal is there. But there's also the question of whether those medications are working, you know, whether she's on the right uh, medication regime, whether there are other psychiatric interventions that would be more relevant, you know, if, if she's somebody that, for instance, would meet criteria for treatment-resistant depression, where it's, you know, a really sticky issue. Medications have been tried and don't work. Maybe multiple medications have. There are other possibilities as well that she could talk with um, a psychiatrist about. So that's another thing that if you feel like it's, it's relevant, you could also bring up or push her toward. Um, but in the end, I want to, you know, wrap this up by saying that she's allowed to be depressed right? She's allowed to be depressed. Presumably she's not doing anything wrong by being depressed. And at least she, unless she's at risk of harming herself or harming her family, you can also maybe just let her be a little bit and provide whatever support you can, but not more than that. And you're allowed to be okay, even if she's not okay. Um, and otherwise recognize that this is a part of how her personality is structured and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you, even if it is 
a little frustrating at times because it bleeds over into your life. So keep caring, you know, keep trying, but also have a healthy degree of separation here and realize that even if nothing changed, um, it sounds like from what you said, she's relatively functional. She's just really sad and that's okay. You know, she's allowed to be that way. And if she wants to get more help, there probably is more help out there for her to get. So thank you for writing in the question. I appreciate it. As I said, it's, it's good to hear that you care about her in this way. Hopefully this gives you some things to think about though. Uh, so thanks. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Acorn TV. So I hope that you guys are getting some time off of work, some time to spend just being lazy and all of that for the holiday season here. And with that, I hope you have some time to just binge watch some television because sometimes there's nothing better than that. Um, If you've burned through basically all the television that's out there on the conventional platforms, you might want to check out Acorn TV. Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free British streaming service that has compelling stories, exclusive premieres, and originals that you won't find anywhere else. Um, There's always something new to discover. They have hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, not just the UK. And there's everything there with actors that you know and love, uh, people like Thaddy Newton, David Tennant, a lot of really good actors, cleverly written shows, visually striking. And every time I do one of these ads, I have my mother-in-law who legitimately... Um, you know, not, not paying her to do this. She just loves Acorn TV and loves British TV. So she always chooses a show to break down for me. Okay, so this is a transmission directly from my mother-in-law. Today we shall discuss the Invisibles. Two gentlemen getting up in years decide to return to their previous lives of crime. High-class robbers that attempt to rekindle the successes they've had for years. Only now, as age has not been entirely kind to them, some of their situations become almost comedic. A pleasure to watch. Anthony Head an alumni from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, is particularly entertaining. So thank you for that. Is it Heed, Anthony Heed? I hope I (laughs) It's spelled head, So, but it's probably Heed. Sorry, Anthony, if that's the case. Um, But yeah, that's one of them, and there are many others. If you go to their website and check it out, you can see just a sampling of the the tons of shows that are on the platform. Uh, And it's just a fraction of the cost compared to most streaming services at just $5.99 a month. So you can try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv, use my promo code DUFF, but you have to enter the code in lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV, code DUFF, to get Acorn TV free for 30 days. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question number two. Uh, This is an interesting one, a little bit different than other recent topics I've had on the show. And this one reads, I hope it's okay to ask. It may be a little irrelevant to most topics on your podcast. And also, sorry if it's already been addressed. Quick side note, you can always check the website. Use the search bar on the website, duffthesec.com. You know, type in a couple keywords relevant to your potential question. See if anything's there. But in this case, definitely, this is a pretty unique one. I have been on and off active addiction to methamphetamine and heroin and have done some things that I'm feeling a lot of shame over, such as lying to family abusing help offered, and theft. I know that I should be feeling a certain amount of healthy guilt, but this time getting clean, I'm struggling with my self-worth because most of what I feel is shame. I know that I over-exaggerate the harm I've done because for a majority of my addiction, all I've done is disappear. How do I work on overcoming the severe guilt that makes me feel like I'm unworthy of a healthy life now? So really good question. Thank you for this. Um, I I appreciate the question. And I want to say that I'm proud of you for fighting this fight and trying to make progress in your addictions. It's hard. It can be extremely hard. And I think that there's bravery in even trying, especially if you feel um, and you've had the experience of having to come back over and over after being knocked down, you know, having some progress with recovery and then falling into relapse and repeating that cycle. It, It gets harder and it takes more willpower each time. And so I'm proud of you for continuing and I'm proud of you for, you know, being in this place right now where even though you're having a hard time, you're trying to do something about it. I also appreciate your honesty, your willingness to just put this out there because uh, shame is such a big component of addiction. Even writing in anonymously can be hard. So in your question, I I notice a pretty heavy focus on others, on other people. Um, In what you said here, I hear that you are primarily concerned with things like letting other people down, uh, misusing or abusing the care that they've tried to give you, things of that sort, right? Letting people down, feeling guilty about the way that you've treated them during the addiction, during the recovery, 
um, that you've maybe thrown away, help that they've given because you've relapsed, stuff like that. And there's a lot of that in there. So clearly you're not feeling great about yourself. Um, and as you mentioned, your self-concept is not very high. I think that's totally understandable given what you've been through. I'll talk more about this, but I do think that you deserve to think about yourself as well in this situation. But uh, even if, let's just kind of do a thought experiment here. Even if you didn't think that you deserve any sort of self-consideration, right? You feel totally guilt-ridden, indebted to these other people in your life that maybe you've let down or misused in some way. Um, Even if that were the case, think about it. Wouldn't that actually lend itself even more to you living a healthier life now? right? Rather than being unworthy and selfish, wouldn't that actually be the least selfish thing to do? If, if all you were thinking about was other people, wouldn't that be the least selfish thing to do? Because it can, it can truly be partially in honor of these people that you pursue a healthier life. Um, you know, in that case, it would be maybe the most responsible thing for you to do to work on yourself, not the most selfish thing. They've invested in you and they care about you clearly. Otherwise they wouldn't have tried to be there. And it would make a huge difference to them in their life if you succeeded, even if you feel like you don't deserve it. Now, I do think that you should care more about yourself in this whole situation. But, you know, again, even if you didn't, I hope that this helps to illustrate that it still makes sense for you to embrace wellness and try to do something about this, that a healthy life is the best idea in this situation, right? So just a little thought experiment there to help you realize that you know, even if your negative assumption was totally true, that doesn't necessarily need to change your course of action. And it doesn't mean that you don't deserve this. So yeah, you know, like I said, I think that uh, you do deserve to think about yourself. Just as a human being, you have a right to try to find some peace and happiness and live a healthy life. Definitely sure you have regrets. And you mentioned a certain amount of guilt can be healthy here. That's for sure. You know, guilt can be an important barometer to help us guide our behavior. Um, and to some extent, regret and that guilt can be corrective. But I think that you're probably well beyond that now. You're well beyond sort of the productive amount of guilt that you could be feeling. And your self-concept is, presumably, so shattered that you feel like you need to punish yourself somehow. And that punishment can be active, you know, through abusing your body actively. It can also sometimes be passive by denying things and feeling like you don't deserve to be a happy and healthy person. So not allowing yourself to feel pleasure. That's another form of punishment, right? If you think about how you might punish a child, you know, one way is like, you know, hitting them, which, you know, we don't encourage, but that's an active form of punishment, right? You're directly punishing something, negative consequences coming through. Passively, it might be taking away something that they like, you know, taking away a toy or, you know, (laughs) a phone or something like that. That would be a passive way of still providing that punishment. And you can kind of be doing both of those to yourself in this case. If you were to flip this around, think about how you might feel. So imagine that it weren't you in the situation, but imagine that it was somebody else that you care about who was in recovery. And just really think about it. Imagine them. Imagine that they have acted in similar ways to the way that you have that their addiction has made them act in ways that maybe aren't consistent with who they really are as a person, the way that they feel inside. But at the same time, they've, they've done their best not to harm anyone. It's just uh, addiction drives you to do a lot of stuff and they've tried to get better, but it's a sticky problem and they keep falling back down. And at this point they feel like they've done so much wrong that they don't even deserve to get better. They don't even deserve to get healthy. Who are they to take up that sort of space? How would you feel about that? right? We're not talking about you here. We're talking about somebody else. And I really, really want you to take the chance to actually think of a specific person. Maybe you know somebody in your recovery journey, um, or maybe you can just imagine that it's a family member. If you have a sibling, for instance, think of a family member, a close loved one, best friend, somebody who is, uh, you know, somebody that you really care about and imagine them going through what you have, you know, up to this point, And where you're at now, again, in the same position, now feeling guilty about this and that they don't deserve anything. So getting yourself there in your mind, do you feel as negatively toward them? Do you feel like they've forfeited their right to be happy and healthy? So I don't know the answer to that for you, but I have to suspect that the answer is either no or a lot less of a yes than it is when you apply that to yourself. 
So just think about that. You know, you're no different than this hypothetical person or this real person. As I said, you might know somebody like that in recovery, um, but you're no different than them. You are a human being and you're allowed to have a healthy life, even though you've maybe made some mistakes or done things that you would, you've regretted or fallen down a path that you wish you hadn't gone down. You still deserve that. This might be an obvious question, but are you in therapy, <laughs> right? If not, do that. That's a really good thing to be doing here. Um, if you're just, say, in like 12-step meetings and such, that is likely not sufficient to make a really significant and enduring difference for you because there are probably underlying factors that have served to maintain your addiction to keep it going. Things like your past, your view of yourself, all of that. These are things that can be delved into and worked through in therapy. And I don't have any information about you in terms of that stuff, but you know, if you have a, a history of trauma, for instance, if you have um, you know, grown up in a chaotic environment, if you're in a place that has a lot of violence, if you are discriminated against for any number of reasons, there are so many things that can be factors that contribute to substance use and addiction. And those things can be micro, you know, they can be things within yourself, like your self-concept, they can be, you know, expanding a little bit out to your immediate family, a little bit out to your extended family, to school, work, that level, to society in general, as I said, discrimination, things like that. There are a lot of different levels of this sort of, um, these sort of intersecting or concentric rather <laughs> circles to think about. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that could potentially be delved into and processed in a setting like therapy. Addiction is tough and it's weird. You know, I know this. Uh, people have a really hard time understanding why addiction is possible, but it's just a difficult thing. You might have so much knowledge in your brain about the situation. If you've been in recovery for a significant amount of time, you probably could teach a whole class on it. So you have all this knowledge in your brain. You know what you should be doing with yourself. But when it comes down to it, you know, your body tells you a different story. And that's very difficult to ignore. And you find yourself doing things that you didn't even feel like you had control over. And that becomes even more difficult when the addiction serves a very good purpose in your life, right? When your mental health almost dictates that you need something else to keep you going or your work or whatever, when there's something in your life that, that serves as a thing to maintain your addiction, it gets even harder to let that go. So as I said, digging into these underlying factors, this can help you maintain your recovery and avoid falling into future relapses. This is another thing. Um, I'm not sure if you've already done this a bit or not, but what about addressing these concerns with others? So the concerns that you wrote about initially in your question, um, I have to imagine there are some specific people that come to your mind when you talk about the guilt that you feel toward, toward others or the way that you've maybe mistreated people. Could you literally talk to those people about it? Could you ask them? Um, you know, one thing you could do maybe is tell them how you're feeling. Tell them that, you know, you feel like you've used them, that you've squandered their care. Maybe you've directly stolen from them or something like that. And because of those things, you now feel that it's just hard to feel justified in succeeding, that you don't deserve to get better because of the way that you've hurt them. And see what they say about it, right? These might be very difficult questions to ask, but I feel like they could be really telling. And uh, I think that these people in, in, in your life, or even if they're not in your life anymore, I think that they deserve the benefit of the doubt as much as you do. So your assumption might be that they don't want to help or that they don't care anymore or that you would just feel more guilty for bringing them into it. But give them some of the benefit of the doubt. As I said, they've invested in you at some point in your life and in your journey here. And it might mean a lot to them to be able to sort of keep you on track. Um, there are a couple other things to think about in addition to this stuff. Uh, I don't think that in this case, just blind guilt is very helpful in guiding your behavior. But um, to make it more productive, it can sometimes be helpful to think about the consequences of inaction. What happens if you take no action on this? So if you do nothing about this, you know, uh, and, and you could look at the positive and negative here. If you do nothing about this, who benefits and who might be harmed from this trajectory? This is a great thing to process in your journal if you have one. And I highly suggest you have one because there's a lot of internal work and processing and even tracking things, you know, um, writing down a record of what you've been going through so you can refer to it down the line. That's all great stuff to do in a journal. So if you don't have one, definitely pick one up. But writing about this stuff, like, okay, let's think about it. If I don't change anything here, where is this going to go? What, what does this trajectory look like carried a year away, two years away, five years away, any of that? 
Um, and then, you know, you can use the same platform to think about the consequences of taking action. Who serves to benefit from me doing something about this? What difference would it make to yourself, to your body, to the people around you, to your society, to the world in general? What difference would it actually make if you were to make progress here, even if that progress is incremental and step by step? Um, you know, for instance, let's say that you have a, a parent or a grandparent who is you know, not the primary reason that you've fallen into your addiction. They're not a terrible person. They haven't harmed you, but they're on your side. They don't know what to do, but they want to see you get better. Maybe they've given you some money for treatment. Maybe they've, you know, picked you up from places, whatever, and they would just love to see you do better. Every step along that path will serve to make them feel um, good. You know, they don't have to feel great. They don't have to feel better. It's not your job to make them happy, but, um, they would be proud of you for each of those steps. And so you making some action here that would potentially cause a direct change in those people that we're talking about. Lastly, um, maybe you're thinking a little bit too much about who this is for, you know, whether others are deserving of your recovery, whether you're worthy of recovering and becoming healthy, et cetera. Instead, maybe you could externalize it a little bit. Well, I mean, I guess it's not external. It, it is very internal, but you're taking a different approach by looking at your values, right? What is it that really matters to you as a person? What is it that matters to you in this world? Why do you get out of bed in the morning when you've had many opportunities to, to stop doing that? If you can connect to some of these fundamental values of yours, that gives you another way to judge yourself. So it's not just about you know, deserving or not deserving recovery, success or failure in recovery. It's about a deeper issue, which is your values. Not based off some nebulous idea of doing right or wrong, but how are you moving toward or how are you moving away from your values? And that's another way that you can sort of judge your actions and help, you know, serve as one of those compasses to guide your behavior. And that's something that's a little bit more stable, a little bit more productive than just sort of these vague ideas of good and bad. So again, another thing that you can process in your journal, what are your values? Maybe you can do some searching online of, you know, different exercises you can use to, to figure out what your values are. Uh, one little trick that I often like is to look at your frustrations. And it's kind of funny, but you think about the things that really get your goat, things that are um, inordinately frustrating for you or, or, or really just piss you off. Why do they piss you off so bad, right? What is it that bugs you about that so much? A lot of times when you dig into that, that frustration is the flip side of some value of yours, right? If you really value being on time and it drives you absolutely crazy, I guess I already said the value, but like if, if it drives you absolutely crazy when people are late, why is that? What value is that sort of acting against? Well, maybe you feel like time is precious, that life is precious. And when people waste other people's time, that's not fair. So, you know, that could be a value of yours. Uh, maybe there's something related to uh, the way people treat each other or animals or the environment, anything, you know, you can kind of dig into this a bit and see what the values are on the flip side of your frustrations. Just a tip, but there are many other ways to, to kind of go about looking into your values as well. Um, a lot of literature in ACT therapy, so acceptance and commitment therapy might be helpful here. There are plenty of, uh, you know, kind of uh, consumer side, patient side books, not just for clinicians and therapists that could help you with this. Um, just do a quick search online for those. But yeah, I think that that could be something that, that might help you have something else to focus on. But yeah, thank you for this question. I think that you're doing a good job. And I think, honestly, it's irrelevant whether you deserve this or not. Is it the correct choice? Yes, right? It's the correct choice. Do you deserve it? I think that's also yes, but that doesn't matter quite as much. But is it the correct choice? Yeah, it is. So keep going. You got this. And with that, that is the end of the episode, guys. This has been episode 283 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. If you want the show notes, go to depthofpsych.com slash episode 283. You can also find all of my information, you know, basically everything that I've done on there, old podcast episodes, blog posts, lots of good stuff on the website. Um, and if you want to send me an email with a question, send it to depthofpsych at gmail.com. All right, guys, enjoy yourselves. I really, really appreciate your attention. I really appreciate you listening. Have a great rest of your week, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.